Hi everybody. This video is part one in a series of four videos about Christian mysticism. We're going to be looking at the work of four authors, starting this time with Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite. We'll make some sense out of even that man's name uh, and some of the works that, that we have from him. Um, we'll also include in this series Meister Eckhart, uh, Teresa of Avila, and John of the Cross. So look for those on the channel, please. Let's get started with Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite. Here we have an image of the man, if, if it is such. I mean, thinkers like this are so ancient and unknown that no actual images exist, but this mosaic is uh, associated with Pseudo Dionysius. Uh, and let's move on and try and make a little sense out of this guy's name. Who is Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite? Well, he was a major author in the early Christian tradition. And I can't overstate this. The authority of this guy, Dionysius, was right up there with St. Paul, who wrote a lot of the letters in the New Testament, even with the Gospels themselves. He was counted among the church fathers, named with Augustine and uh, Ambrose and other uh, luminaries of that early period, right? Uh, why was this so? Because it was believed for many years, for more than a millennium and a half, in fact, that Dionysius was the guy converted by St. Paul when he visited Athens um, at a place called the Areopagus, uh, which is a kind of open air space in Athens where people would gather to hear uh, what other people had to say. It was a kind of forum area, right? Um, so Dionysius is just a name, and the Areopagite refers to the fact that the guy was thought to have been at the Areopagus, right? Um, this is told about in Acts 17, and I want to take a look at that passage in, in just a minute, but we'll say a bit more here first about, um, about this author. Um, during the period when, um, well, let, let's close the circle on the story first, right? So it was around the time of the Reformation when humanistic scholarship was really surging, people were looking at these texts in their originals, going back to the earliest manuscripts available. And last point on the slide here, it became clear to scholars that this author, thought to have been alive at the time of St. Paul, right, converted by him, um, in fact, was writing in the fifth or sixth century uh, in Syria. Uh, and, you know, this textual scholarship gave evidence of this that was felt to be irrefutable. So Dionysius from the Areopagus, Dionysius the Areopagite, became Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite. Uh, that is the author whose name is not really that, um, but is associated with it. So there you have it, story of Pseudo-Dionysius. Um, he was, uh, during the period from, you know, uh, the time of his writing in the 5th or 6th century until um, the 15th century or 16th, he was a big influence on Thomas Aquinas and on other authors that we've seen in this course. Augustine would have certainly read him. Um, he was even believed at one point to have been the Bishop of Paris. Um, so if you ever travel to Paris and you go to the Rue Saint-Denis, a lot of French cities have a, a Rue Saint-Denis, uh, Montreal has a street by that name. That's named for Pseudo Dionysius. Uh, he was a, a central figure. Okay, well, let's get into a bit of where he came from and how the story of his work developed, and then we'll see how it is influential on the tradition known as Christian mysticism. Here we have an image of St. Paul in the Areopagus, a later painting, of course. Um, St. Paul goes there to Athens. He's on one of his several journeys where he will found many Christian communities that then he writes letters to. And that's how we get the letters in the New Testament. Paul is writing to churches that he helped to establish. Um, at this speech in the Areopagus, uh, well, we have a text of that speech in the book of the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament, and I have a portion of that here. I, I think we can say this is the relevant portion for our purposes. So let, let's take a look here at what Paul did when he went to Athens and supposedly met this person, Dionysius. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. 
So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Okay, pause. So what's he saying? Lots of different altars around the city of Athens to various gods and kind of kind of like uh, in the United States we have a tomb of the unknown soldier uh, they had a shrine or an altar to an unknown god right kind of representing the gods that, that had been missed in a way Paul takes this as an opportunity to kind of answer that implicit question who is this unknown god in what sense is God unknown and that's going to prove significant in just a moment here. Let's continue with the passage. The God who made the world, Paul continues, and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything that is needed anything from us, right? He is not far from any one of us for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring, offspring of God. We come from God. We continue to live and move and have our being in God, right? And we can also say about the second paragraph that God does not need anything from us, right? God in God's self is self-sufficient, just like the creator of an artwork does not need the artwork, right? The creator is self-sufficient in herself, and the artwork exists separately from her, and, and thus, too, do we at this time. Right? Last paragraph here, short one. At that, <clears throat> we're skipping a little portion of the end of the speech, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of of the Areopagus. Right, so this is the origin story of Dionysius the Areopagite. Let's move on <clears throat> and talk a bit about why this figure is so significant. Okay, we've decided that he was for a very long time significant. His works are still influential, even though their authorship has been successfully contested. Why is he significant? Mainly because he introduces and makes prominent a distinction between two ways of talking about God two ways of talking about God. We use the term for this, theology, right? We've defined theology as faith-seeking understanding, right? Well, there are two different approaches in that quest, in that effort to understand what we mean when we talk about God, right? The first of these on the slide here is positive theology. In Greek, the term is cataphatic theology. We had a commentary assigned this week from the author Andrew Louth, who helps us to understand uh, these, this distinction, these two terms. Positive theology is probably exactly what you think about when you think about theology or when you think about religion, right? What is God? Well, God, God is omnipotent. God is everywhere. God is good. God is love, right? Um, this is what God is. They're all uh, predicates, that we assign to God. They're all characteristics, right? Things we associate with God positively. Um, this uh, is corresponding, well, we'll take a look on the next slide to the, the, the Neoplatonic connection here, right? The other half of this is negative theology, and in Greek we call this apophatic theology, and that term is very often used, even in English. Um, this is concerned not with what God is, but with what God is not, right? And that doesn't just mean, you know, God is not evil. God is not mean, you know, whatever it is. It's something like God is not good. God is not love or loving. God is not father. It's a strange language because you think, well, this, this is a religion, right? So, I mean, certainly it must be kind of heresy or <laughs> some kind of um, sacrilege to, to deny those qualities of God. But what is really happening in a negative style of theology? What the authors are saying is that we have an idea of goodness and beauty and truth. We have an idea of God, uh, or we have an idea of what a father is, right? Or we have an idea of, of, of what love is. Whatever God is, as the creator of all of those things, infinitely goes beyond our human conception of them, right? So yes, in a positive sense, God is good. 
That's what religion teaches, and Christians will accept that. But if they are connected with this mystical tradition, if they're practicing also negative theology, they will recognize that anything you can say about God falls short of the essence of God, right? In developing this way of thinking, Pseudo-Dionysius is unfolding a distinction from Neoplatonism. Now, we saw that already in the work of St. Augustine. Remember, St. Augustine was very influenced by these, these Neoplatonic philosophers, right? We, we looked at that in connection with his chapter in the Confessions, or I think it was book seven or so of the Confessions. Um, this style of philosophy became really popular among early Christians and has left a permanent mark on how Christianity thinks about God and the revelation of God um, through the scripture and through the person of Jesus Christ. Um, let's take a closer look at this Neoplatonic connection, right? Um, on the slide we have, Neoplatonism, as we saw with Augustine, envisioned a movement of procession from and return to the one, right? So there is, in Neoplatonic thinking, the one. No diversity, no multiplicity, no change, no time, right? This one is in itself self-sufficient, exists outside of time, and really you can't even say it exists because it is everything, right? This one is the kind of seed from which everything uh, flows, kind of mixing metaphors there. We used the image before of a fountain to describe um, this idea of the one, and we can refer to that as we look at the chart here on, on the screen. So the one, um, it says on the chart, emanates, right, kind of overflows into mind. The Greek word for that is nous, the intellect, right? And then this intellect overflows into life, right? The, the principle of life, we call it the soul, right? And here it's uh, um, named as the world soul. Uh, and then this, it's in turn, emanates into the sense world, the material things that we see all around us, and then we ourselves are material beings, right? We, we born, live, die, have a physical body, feel cold and hungry, and all the rest. So this, for the Neoplatonist, is how creation happens and I say that in the present tense, because it's not a belief that creation happened long ago in the past, and God kind of, you know, made the watch and wound it up, and now the watch just ticks away. Um, the idea is that creation is an ongoing thing, right? And that at every moment, the one is overflowing into these lower um, levels of being. The goal of the spiritual life, the goal of religion, say, is to return, right? And here on the chart, it's labeled as transcendence, right? So what we are as material beings with intellect and a soul has emanated from the one, the source, where we come from. And the goal is to return to that source, to transcend the body, to focus on things of the soul, to transcend the soul, to focus on truths of the intellect. And finally, even to transcend the intellect, to go beyond categories that we think in, to experience and to become one with that which is beyond them. Right? So it's in this sense that we can say that God is not good. By saying God is not good, we're not saying that God is bad. We're saying that God is beyond the human category of good, and that if we wish to be one with God, to return to God, to, to achieve or to be granted that consummation of the spiritual life, we must also transcend the concepts, the categories in which we think. Right? So we're moving in a certain sense, and Nietzsche might have this in mind later, beyond good and evil. But in that, we're not moving into a space of, of uh, pure uh, undefinition. We're moving back to this ultimate reality from which we came, right? So for Christians, and this is the second little section on here, um, the one was beyond all being or beings, right? God was the cause of all things. This one was God in God's self, right? The source of all things. So um, to talk about 
you know, the, the question, does God exist, right? Give, give me evidence that God exists. Well, it, there's, there's this argument and this argument and this argument. For Christianity and for these Neoplatonists, it, it's a strange question to ask if the one exists, right? Is there a unity at the basis of all things? Well, I don't know. The proofs for the existence of God don't seem to touch that. They seem to be asking about a specific being, right? You might say, who created God? Well, on this picture, that question doesn't compute really, because God is the source of all things beyond anything that exists. God does not, properly speaking, exist or not exist, right? God simply is. Uh, and, and is identical with this one. So I, I know these are complex things, but I, I encourage you to, to think on them. We're really talking about an experience that goes beyond our concepts and categories and reunites us with the source of our being. That's the uh, quest that, that Pseudo Dionysius and uh, Proclus, this Neoplatonic author, is inviting us to. Positive theology, saying what God is, is for Pseudo Dionysius proper to that emanation, to the move away from God, right? We're moving from that kind of um, indeterminate oneness of God in the one out to specific beings, right? In, in intellect, in soul, or in body. Um, the negative theology of realizing that our categories are insufficient for Pseudo Dionysius corresponds to the movement of transcendence right, the movement back up, the return. So once we have done all we can with the positive categories, right, we, we've articulated all we can, we, we've found a language for all we can, the, the final step, the thing remaining to us is to move beyond that language, not abandoning it, uh, but finding what it points to uh, beyond itself. <clears throat> So, for this author, Pseudo-Dionysius, we need both of these styles of theology, both of these kinds of theology. It's not enough simply to have positive theology, because that gets us stuck in a kind of plodding, unsophisticated way of understanding God. We, we're treating God like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, right? We're looking for some being out there. Um, and for Pseudo-Dionysius, that is, that is a superficial way of understanding what Christianity means when it speaks about God. Um, but that's why we also need negative theology, right? And to the second point on the slide here, negative theology for Pseudo-Dionysius is actually deeper than positive theology. It's more fundamental. Science, uh, I'm sorry, well, science is interesting too. Silence is more fundamental than speech, right? Simply being in the presence and knowing or being a certain way in relation to the one is deeper than having an intellectual understanding of it. It's more fundamental, right? Um, we have a quotation here from our commentator, Andrew Louth. It often goes beyond words, that is negative theology. It takes us beyond language, concepts, categories. Quote, as we plunge into that darkness which is beyond intellect, we shall find ourselves not simply running short of words, but actually speechless and unknowing. Right? If you want to kind of reach that pinnacle of the spiritual life, you need to go beyond language and categories and what we customarily think of as, as knowledge. I just want to look at a few passages. We're going to have two kind of longer ones here and then just some quotations from the assigned reading and, and just talk through them a bit because clearly, I mean, I think even for many people who are raised within Christian traditions, this way of thinking is new and unfamiliar. Let's take a look at these passages. Um, so this one I've given the title, How We Know God, right? And it's taken from Pseudo Dionysius. Uh, Andrew Louth quotes this. It's from uh, a work by Pseudo Dionysius called The Divine Names. Right? God is known through knowledge and through unknowing. Two options. You can know God through knowledge or you can know God through unknowing. Of God, there is conception, reason, understanding, touch, perception, opinion, imagination, name, and many other things. Right? These are positive 
theologies, right? These are things that we say are true about God, positive things. On the other hand, now we're moving to negative theology, God cannot be understood, words cannot contain him, and no name can lay hold of him. He is not one of the things that are, and he cannot be known in any of them. God is not a thing. God is not a single being. God is being itself, right, in this tradition. The most divine knowledge of God, that which comes through unknowing, negative theology, is achieved in a union far beyond mind, when mind turns away from all things, even from itself, and when it is made one with the dazzling rays, being then and there enlightened by the inscrutable depth of wisdom. Dazzling rays there, it's a strange phrase. Uh, Pseudo Dionysius uses this um, in reference to the rays of darkness, kind of a reverse of what you would think, right? But yes, God is light, right? And, and casts light on the understanding. We are given knowledge of God. Knowledge of God is revealed to us, right? But beyond that, what do we have here? Conception, reason, understanding, all these things. Beyond those things is unknowing. Beyond those things is darkness, right? Not darkness in a sense of, of being bad or, or evil. Um, it's not a moral category. Uh, it's a category about knowledge, right? That, that we cannot kind of grasp what's going on <laughs> with God, uh, with our categories. Let, let's go on and look at the, the next passage here. This is from our commentator, Andrew Louth himself. <clears throat> and I've given this the title of the influence of this theology. So Pseudo Dionysius' negative theology, this thing we've been talking about, calls on the imagination to interpret a richness of experience that cannot be reduced to rational categories. A richness that borders on, or rather clearly transgresses, the paradoxical, as in the widespread imagery and experience of a dazzling darkness, right? Pause. This author is using paradoxes. What is a paradox? It's something that your reason gets kind of stranded on it, right? It doesn't make sense if you think about a paradox. You go, oh, well, what, how can I understand that, right? That's the goal here, is to actually lead you to the edge of your rational understanding and then gesture you beyond that, right? To this reality of God or the one uh, beyond reason. It has quarried in the West Quarried means it has, it has given us resources, right? Uh, and he's talking here, Andrew Louth, about negative theology. Negative theology has quarried in the West a sense of the inward already opened up by the questing spirit of Augustine, right? Because if we're going beyond reason, pause, we're going beyond reason, that is happening somehow within ourselves, right? It's not visible. It's not an argument that I can lay out on the paper. By thinking of God in this way as going beyond reason, we're opening up that inward dimension, right? And Augustine is, is building on that, or Augustine is, is um, giving us um, an example of that. Continuing, um, negative theology has paved the way for a sense of the personal, based on an experience of ecstatic encounter in love, our encounter with God, with the one. Its baffling affirmation of a God who is not resists the too human tendency, never fully checked in the West, to be satisfied with a God who too comfortably is and then is too easily dispensed with. What does he mean by this? If we think that God is like the Loch Ness Monster, right? I'm going to prove the existence of God. Here's the proof. Accept it, you know, rationally, uh, then that's the same kind of thing as trying to disprove God, disprove that Loch Ness monster. We're here engaged just in, in, on the level of rational arguments and categories of, of what makes logical sense. And those things are, of course, very important. That's positive theology. But 
What Louth is suggesting here is that within Christianity, there is this much deeper understanding of God. And all of these arguments against God that, that we might hear today, whether it's based on um, science or, or morals or, or anything else, for this tradition, don't really touch the subject, right? <laughs> because the experience of God is something that's deeply within us, deeply personal, and which cannot be dispelled by argument, right? Because this reality of God goes beyond argument. Let's look at just a few short passages from Pseudo Dionysius himself, from the assigned reading, and we'll try and keep this under about 30 minutes and keep it short. So we read in Pseudo Dionysius, O Trinity, beyond being, beyond divinity, beyond goodness, and guide of Christians in divine wisdom. Pause. The Trinity is beyond being. It doesn't make sense to ask if it is or is not. It's beyond that, right? It's beyond divinity, right? Even the idea of God is too confining here. It's beyond goodness. Same thing. Human idea of God, right? The reality goes beyond that human idea. O Trinity, direct us to the mystical summits more than unknown and beyond light. There the simple, absolved, and unchanged mysteries of theology lie hidden in the darkness beyond light of the hidden mystical silence. Right? Mysticism is leading us beyond rational thought, beyond the categories of the understanding. There, in the greatest darkness, that beyond all that is most evident, exceedingly illuminates sightless intellects. Your intellect is sightless because we've taken away all of the reasoning and the categories and the ideas that you rely on. We're beyond that now. We're in this darkness, right? But it's an illuminating darkness that's a paradox. That's a paradox, right? There, in the holy, imperceptible, and invisible, that beyond all that is most evident fills to overflowing the sightless intellects with the glories beyond all beauty. God is not beautiful. God is not merely beautiful. God is beyond all beauty. The category of beauty pales. It fails to convey what we mean by God. Another passage. Into the dark beyond all light we pray to come. Through not seeing and not knowing to see and know that beyond sight and knowledge itself. Neither seeing nor knowing. God is beyond sight and knowledge themselves, right? We don't simply open our eyes and see God. We don't make an argument and thereby know God. God goes beyond those capacities, and that's where he is praying, as it were, that we might be led through our prayer, through our practice. For by the denial of all that is, one sees knows, and beyond beingly hymns the beyond being. Ooh, <laughs> that's interesting, right? We deny all that is. We deny that the categories of our understanding, the things we perceive in the world, all these things that we take for granted that are the basis of sanity in the world, right? We deny that those things are ultimate. We recognize that the distinctions between things are ultimately relative to the, to the oneness, right? To the oneness of God, the one who created all things. Once you do that, you move beyond created things, then you can see, and then you can know, and then you can hymn, which is a beautiful use of the noun hymn, like a church hymn, right? As a verb. You're singing, right? You're singing what you experience beyond being. It's a remarkable notion. Your prayer can lead you to this. This is the Christian mystical tradition. This is 
probably the, the central basis, the central pillar at the basis of that tradition. Just a couple more, and here we're not going to read all of these aloud, but I invite you to pause and take a look at them, right? I've, I've, my notations are here, right? I've, I've highlighted, I see most of the knots, right? What is God? What is the creator of all things, right? God is not soul, not intellect, not imagination, opinion, reason, understanding, not logos, not intellection, and we continue, right? Not great or small, not like or unlike, not powerful or powerless, right? Not knowledge, not truth, not divinity, not goodness. Oh my goodness, what is going on here, right? Uh, he's, he's not denying that these things are true in the sense of positive theology, right? Things have been revealed to human beings and those things are for this author and for Christian mystical tradition, true. They are true. But the fullness of truth goes beyond these things. And thus can we say, God is not goodness, right? It sounds so heretical, and yet when understood in connection with positive theology as an extension of it, as going beyond it, it opens up the fullness of what Christianity teaches about God. And the last slide for us here, and then we'll wrap up. Um, and this is a remarkable one. Disclose this not to the uninitiated, not to those, I say, who are entangled in beings. Imagine nothing to be beyond beingly beyond beings and claim to know by the knowledge in them he who has made the dark his hiding place. Him who has made. First line, disclose this not to the uninitiated. Right? If a person knows nothing about Christian revelation, Christianity, Christian practice, right? And you start saying to them, God is not good. God is not, right? This is just a dangerous confusion, right? Because they don't have a basis that they can move beyond, right? That they'll, they'll just get lost in the paradox. Right? So in this tradition, at least for this author, he's saying, don't tell people who won't understand it because it will mislead them. They are entangled in beings, right? They can imagine nothing beyond categories and things, right, with properties. They're not ready to make that move beyond being to this direct apprehension of and ultimately unity with God, right? So it's an interesting question, friends. You know, is this tradition, uh, certainly today we might say it's it's elitist, right? There, there is a certain spiritual enlightenment that prepares one to not only to read about these things, but to practice these things, to, to pray on these things, right? Um, but of course, anyone can reach this. And the tradition is calling people who are Christian to enter more deeply into that Christian faith and to see that Christianity is not about rational arguments. Christianity is about that return to union with the source of our being, uh, which this tradition calls God. Thank you very much. This was part one in a four-part series on Christian mysticism, and we will be back next time to talk about Meister Eckhart.